So hello, welcome grade 11 parents and students to uh, this second uh, video in the series um, for you to get started researching and doing your exploration. Um, oh, I'm Mr Forrester and... I'm Mr Wickham, nice to meet you all. And Mr Sabanda will be with us soon by the end of the month and uh, more on that uh, towards the end of this presentation. So uh, this uh, presentation is called Moving Forward in Your Preparation, Reflecting and Research Time, which basically means time to reflect and research. And we're just going to go about giving you some important notices, things that you need to know at this stage, as well as how to go about that research itself. So we have the agenda here. These are the items that we're going to go through uh, today. We're going to look at priorities. What do you want from the university experience? That's the most important thing for you to be considering at this stage. Then we're going to go and look into how to research, where to find information using the tracker. Uh, and then we're going to start talking about some country guidance to, uh, for uh, a number of different destinations, such as the UK, the US, Canada, the Netherlands, uh, and, uh, and beyond. And then uh, we're also going to start um, talking to you about testing, as well as Schoology and the to-do list before we move on to events and uh, university visits as well. So I just want to have a quick reminder about the idea of FIT. This was discussed in our intro video uh, before Christmas, where we talked about how the student uh, needs to be at the center of the process with the family and the college counseling department supporting. So really, the student is the focus driving things forwards. That's the idea. So the idea of fit is that uh, the student is looking for and finds an institution or a career option that meets academic, emotional, geographic, uh, or geographical, social, and financial needs. So everybody's needs will be different, and it's important to consider those needs rather than just necessarily looking for a brand name or a school based only on reputation. It's very important that thought towards what's most important for the student uh, uh, is considered because... Um, if a student goes to a place and doesn't consider the priorities of which they find most important from their experience itself, then they're less likely to be set up to be successful on the course and therefore potentially not even convert through to, uh, to graduate. So um, it's very important to think about priorities. So when I talk about priorities, this is, uh, these are some examples of things that can be considered to be a student's priority. We've talked about uh, the notion of priorities and best fit already. So I'm going to talk you through how we're going to go about our research because we've heard so much about this, you need to research, you need to explore, but let's see how that can actually happen. So spend some time thinking about the aspects that are most important to, to you from your university experience. Please also try to spend some time to discuss those priorities with your college counsellor. Discuss them with your family. Make a list of at least four of these priorities and share this with your college counsellor, okay? Uh, students uh, that are working with Mr Sabanda, you'll be able to find the tracker on the Schoology Grade 11 page, and I'll also be sharing that with you in a minute. So once you've picked your priorities, as I've said, you're putting them into your tracker. This is your tracker. Now, the priorities that I've decided to, to think about are student support, travel, location and distance, wider life. So, let's talk about what each one is. Student support is things such as your learning, so you may have some learning support needs. You want to check out to see if the student union, what they give in terms of help in financial or mental health support or course materials. 
Make sure that there are services in place if, for example, you run into difficulties. And in relation to this, if you are an international student, you may want to familiarise yourself with the support at the university and how they may help to integrate you into the student body. So this is the student support. We'll look at places where we can find that in a little while. The next one is travel. So some universities uh, give you, and some courses within certain universities, give you the ability to have some kind of travel as part, as part of your um, course. So um, you might have a two plus one program or a two plus two program where you've got two years in one institution and two years in a partnership university. Or you might have a university where there's the ability for you to have uh, to be in a new country in each different year of your time studying there. So, for example, there is ESCP Business School, which uh, enables students to have a year in Berlin, a year in Warsaw, or Turin, or Paris, or London. Now, you've got Minerva, for example, uh, that is a university that is based in San Francisco, relatively new one, but it allows students to be placed in places such as Buenos Aires, Berlin as well, Seoul, ta Taipei and London. So if that is um, something that is important to you, that gives you the chance to kind of look into that further. Location and distance. You need to think about the ease to go home. Um, you know, number of connecting flights and how to get there or the location from a city. Do you want a rural or suburban, a location that you and your family are both comfortable with is a good starting place. A location that might suit your personality will mean that you're more uh, likely and inclined to spend time exploring your surroundings and your surrounding area and make the most of it. And also wider life. You've got extracurricular activities, societies and athletics. College is also a time to explore new hobbies and passions, develop new passions. Um, and so there will be some absolute must do's uh, that you would also want to continue with. OK. To your Bridgeview profile. OK, this is uh, the place where you go to to start working out what universities are out there um, and what universities you want to start investigating more, all right? So the great thing about Bridgeview is it will start to uh, create a, a, a list, or generate a list based on your preferences, based on how you answered your profile builder. Now, here's the thing. If you have not filled out your profile builder like this so far, OK, then make sure that that's the first thing that you are doing if you do not have any uh, answers to these questions. Because what will happen is the profile builder will help to now, once they're answered, generate a list of universities that are arranged in terms of reach, match, or target, and safety. Now, it's very important to realize that this list is to be used with a caveat. It doesn't mean that all of those that are in the match are definitely matches for you, but it's a good starting place. And how are you gonna find out whether or not they truly are uh, well fitted to how well you're getting on academically is by you spending time researching the entry requirements and uh, or the average admission rates to certain places. And that's part of that research process. Now, the next step is for you to now then start reading through some of these universities. So if I was to look at Tulane, for example, I'm able to read about general overview, admissions information, location information, let's click to show more, and learn a little bit more about the location down there. But then also I'll be able to find out more about what courses are on offer at this institution, as well as find out why my match score because each of these universities give you a, a preference fit score, why my match score, my preferences, actually says the percentage it does. So apparently Ch Tulane is 88% in, in alignment with what I would like from a university based on how I answered the profile. All right. So here it just kind of breaks down on the right-hand side why that is in terms of kind of the setting of the place, the gender, um, of the cohorts, the region, selectivity, subjects, and so on. On the left, 
you can see a little bit more to do with acceptance uh, rates in relation to my current scores there as well. But again, that's a caveat. The more sources you find this information from, the more well-informed you're going to be as well. So don't only just take Bridgeview's word for it for your um, acceptance rates here. You can then visit the website like so and where you can learn more about the given university that you're looking at there as well. So this is the website for Tulane. Now, back to Bridgeview. At this point, I have the option to say, do I discard this because I'm not really interested in it or do I shortlist it? The idea is that you need to then start shortlisting a range of universities which then you can start adding to your tracker. So in here on the left, you can see my short lists. For the range of shortlisted universities that now I can start to add into my tracker here on the left. Do remember, we the tracker encourages you to think about universities in terms of reach. Notice how there are less reach there than ta and target. So think about it in terms of reach, target, and safety. More in the target would be ideal. And we also need some safety in there as well. Here we go. Here's Tulane in my shortlist. It indicated that it was a bit of a reach for me based on my grades that I put into the profile builder. So in here, I would then put it into Tulane University in as a reach. Um, and I've filled in my different categories of reach, target, and safety on the left here. So here you can see my list of universities on the left. Now, the next thing to do is to go through each one, one by one, Read more about each different university in turn, as mentioned before, and then start filling that in on the tracker inside here under the various categories. So you're filling in your entry requirements, anything related to the course, um, tuition fees, and then start looking at those priorities. Now, it's going to be challenging to find all the information on uh, those four priorities that are most key to you from only the source of BridgeU. So the next thing to do once you have added in everything you can find in BridgeU and on their website into the boxes is to then start to look at these links here on the right hand side. These links, here we have some reviews, we have the FISC's guide and for the UK, Complete University Guide. The next column over, you've got opendays.com, which is for UK universities, you've got UVisit for US, Unitaster Days is exactly what it says there, niche.com is great to compare different universities against each other, Unigo, lots of information on, on the, those pages. The next four Universities are for the US. And this at the bottom here is a very uh, good link to an additional document. So the, click on the tiny URL and you will get to this research document here. This research document can also be accessed on the Schoology pages under the grade 11 uh, page college counselling link. So here we can see that we have got um, universities from Canada, UK and the US. Okay, so inside uh, this tracker you've got all of these universities. There's a long list of them that keeps going on and they have links that will take you to something called the Complete University Guide for UK Universities. So if I was looking for additional numbers, quantitative data, uh, we have some good quantitative data on here on in things in terms of student satisfaction, 
graduate pros prospects and outcomes. And according to what faculty you've got, you can change what we have in here and that will change the figures and, and the numbers that you get in here. Information like student support, which was one of my priorities to find out about. So we have information on learning support in here, uh, health services, well-being and mental, support, uh, mental health support, disability support, bursaries and scholarship links. As well as, well as a ra array of different things such as facilities. And student life, if you remember, wider life was an important thing for me. So we can learn about what the culture is, living in and around this university, the accommodation, what the student union is like. So that links to things such as what clubs and societies there are and how easy it is to get around there and pick up student jobs and, 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 and so on. So also on this research sheet, you will also find links to other things like housing, virtual tours, YouTube official videos, student city guides, life. This is just for the UK. If you move to the US, you will see links to a different website onto Big Future. So Big Future is like Bridge U for College Board. What that means is there's some information that you'll be able to find on these pages that are specific to that university here. So that comes from this research sheet as well. And also you'll find Basic information that's very self-explanatory, distance from a major nearer city, city, setting, state, size, and so on. Are the useful links to things such as virtual tours and, and so on, and useful facilities in and around the area. There's something similar here for Canada as well, if that's one of a country destination that you're looking at doing. So here I'm going to click on British Columbia, and that will take me to another website that helps to summarize and find more additional information on British Columbia University, UBC, University of British Columbia, UBC. So this is your research sheet. Don't forget, there are other links along here in the tracker for you to use as well. And what this is trying to do is drive you into populating the data here while you are thinking about what's important to you and your experience. Another place you can find information is our very own homegrown Schoology page. So in the Schoology pages under resources, you'll be able to find university process and resources, exploring options, and in here we have information on each of the various different universities in these different countries. If you go back to resources, go to your grade level resources, Go to grade 11 college counselling, grade 11 to-do list, which is very useful read. You'll be able to see priorities in here. Corsava is a task that will support you in further thinking about what's important for you for US universities. A previous video was in there. But again, you can then see that research sheet for UK, US and Canada in here a tracker in here if you don't have access to a tracker yet and one hasn't been shared by your college counselor very possible just to click on here and to get a new tracker and further information on these pages too so we just now want to run through very quickly some key issues and points with uh, the four or five most common countries that that our students apply to and some of the processes and a little bit of the deadlines. It's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour and we're going to dig into a little bit more depth uh, as we move through um, the rest of this academic year with individual students. Um, but here is a, is, a, is a very brief overview, starting with the UK. Um, now this is a really interesting centralised mostly application service and what that means is we apply, we have a choice of about 150 universities in the UK and we have five options. That's five choices of course or it could be uh, five courses at the same university, although that's never advised. Um, and, and this is a centralised service. So we have an account with UCAS. Students apply to us, essentially, to the ACS, and then we submit the application on the student's behalf. So that means there's a little bit of time in between uh, kind of a student completing the application and us sending it off to the UCAS uh, University and Colleges Application Service. 
So it's just a couple of important things to consider. Um, the students will be create a, an, app, an account, a, a hub account through UCAS. We will have a full workshop on how to do that sometime in April and May. The act, actual application cannot be started or submitted until uh, August and September, but we'll get set up on the account uh, in April and May when it's ready to go for next year. Um, as I say, there are five choices, which is a limit uh, of the state-funded universities, um, but that's only four if students are interested in medicine, dentistry, veterinary sciences. So we get four options of those courses and then an additional uh, fifth choice uh, for something different. Uh, if students are interested in applying to Oxford or Cambridge, they have one choice, so that's one course and at one institution only. They cannot apply to both. And the really key thing to understand with UCAS is that there are minimum entry requirements for each course. All right. So, uh, for example, uh, an entry requirement might be 666 higher level in the IB and then 36 points overall. A student typically will probably not be considered if their predicted grade falls below that uh, threshold. So this is a credential-based admissions system. It is predominantly geared on academic attainment, and that's really important to bear in mind. Some universities are a little bit more flexible than others. Um, so it's really important to research universities and courses and find out what those minimum qualifications are for entry. So a couple of brief uh, s dates there. October the 6th for anyone applying early. That is the Friday before our midterm break. We have a two-week midterm break next semester. So it's a really important October 6th uh, things are done. And then for every other application to the UK, there is a December 1st deadline. And that gives us time before the winter break to write references, add predicted grades, and get them all submitted to UCAS before the winter break. Just a couple of things that students will need to be thinking about, and again, full guidance, preparation, and workshops will be running on these over the next few months, um, that a university application to the UK requires a personal statement. Now, you might have seen in the news recently uh, things like UCAS scraps personal statement for video courses, video uh, applications. That is simply not true. That is an embellishment, and there are no changes for our current grade 11s. So you will be writing a 4,000-character personal statement just as people have done for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and then we will run a full workshop on this in your English classes uh, through April and May. So there will be plenty of time to prep, draft, get some feedback before the summer break. All right. I kind of mentioned the credential-based admissions system that the UK offers or the UK runs. So this is conditional upon achieving certain qualifications in AP and IB and high school diploma GPA. So it's really important to stay on top of uh, your academic sub subjects over the course of the next couple of years to improve those predictions um, and to keep that GPA high because some certainly for AP students will have a minimum GPA requirement as well as certain scores in AP uh, examinations for instance. If students are not doing any APs or not necessarily maybe enough or the right kind of AP or IB courses there are foundation degree programs available so this is a bridging year it turns a three-year program into a four-year program and it aims to plug the gap either academically or in terms of subject knowledge um, between uh, what a student is leaving high school with and what their first year of the course typically expects of a student all right so we can chat about foundation courses if you're kind of feeling that you've maybe made the wrong choice of ap and ib subjects or perhaps if you're interested in creative subjects uh, like fine art and a foundation course is very typical for students to explore um, their kind of artistic abilities and creativities for a year before deciding to study something like animation or design or um, yeah, painting or, or pottery or sculpture that kind of thing um, there's also a reference that is written by us um, with contributions from your academic teachers and we will obviously need time, hence the slightly earlier deadline of December 1st to give us time to, to do all of that. So that's the UK. Just a very brief look at the US. Uh, obviously, this is the second most popular country that our students apply to. Now, there are 4,000 colleges and universities in the States, so it's really, really important that students are doing deep research and really narrowing down their priorities in terms of it could be state, it could be geography, it could be weather type, it could be um, even certain cities, um, geographic locations. It's, it's really, really crucial that students are doing that deep research and kind of thinking about where they might, you know, what environment might suit them. 
It's really also important to understand that this is a decentralized application system. So each university can have a very different ap uh, application system than another. And that there are um, common application systems, the common app, as we will hear it referred to, which of which about 900 US colleges and universities are subscribed to. But then there are university specific application systems, Georgetown, MIT are two examples of these, and then state university application systems as well. So you cannot apply to a University of California university through the common app, you have to apply through the University of California application system, which has different deadlines. Um, and that's really important to recognize as well that all US universities have different deadlines for submission. Some might be uh, November 1st for early applications, some might be January 1st, some might be January 15th. So we have typically two in internal deadlines to ensure that these are met. One is an early deadline and one is a, a regular deadline, uh, and I'll get to those in a minute. Now there's a lot of time and effort required to making applications to the states. Um, the, the minimum that a student will have to submit is a 650 word personal essay plus um, up to 10 kind of activity list uh, descriptions and examples of the kind of extracurricular wider activities that they are doing. But some of the most selective institutions might have up to 10, if not more, supplementary additional questions, essays, which could be 500 words, they could potentially be up to 400, 500 words. So it's not unusual for a student to potentially be doing 3,000 words of writing just for one university application. And if you were to times that by six, seven, eight, nine uh, applications, it is a lot, a lot of writing. Yes, some can be recycled, some can be reused, some can be tweaked and amended to fit, but there's a lot of research. Um, and because there is so much emphasis on fit in the US, um, and they're often asking why this university or why this major, how do you fit in here, that research into specific institutions is fundamental as well. So good planning preparation through the summer break is vital. And we will start talking about all of this in our one-to-one -one meetings with, your in, with individuals, depending on where it is that they're looking at applying to, and giving you action points to complete over the sort of spring and summer term. Just a couple of things that we will touch on in some advisory workshops as well. Uh, we'll talk about teacher recommendations in March, about how to ask for those and the process by which we do the teacher recommendations. You, we will also have to write a counselor recommendation for you. So the more time you spend with us, the more we get to know you, the better and stronger that counselor recommendation will be. Um, we have also shared with you a self-recommendation form to start completing. And if you work on that over the next six months, by the time we come to write your recommendation in October, November time, um, we will have lots to write about. So please, you know, keep those counselor recommendation or those self-recommendation forms, keep adding to them and working for them. Then we also send a school report, and that's basically a report on the school, how many students are in your grade, what our top scores are, what our passing grade is, that kind of thing, and your academic transcript. So we have to do all of that. There is a lot of back-end admin that we have to do as college counsellors. And then you are responsible for sending certain things as well. That is your testing scores, if applicable. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then any additional information they might need if you are, for example, applying to a creative course, they might need a portfolio, or if you're applying for a music course, they might need some kind of audition tape. Um, so there are other things. It is really important that you as students keep on top of the additional requirements. And then very briefly, uh, some deadlines there. We have, again, an October 13th early deadline for any early decision, early action. So these are the... Um, binding but also kind of um, expression of interest applications that many many students we're seeing now make early applications it used to be reserved for a small number of students and we'll start talking about with you if you're thinking about applying to the US what that looks like for you do you have any universities two or three maybe that you're really really interested in that might be an early application but we have a th October 13th deadline. Again, we've got a two-week break uh, for the midterm break next year, and November 1st falls over our midterm break. So it's important that those are done well in advance. Um, and then for all other applications, deadlines that typically take place in January for the universities, we have a December 1st deadline for those two. We expect them all done because, again, we have to write counselor recommendations. We have to send all this document, make sure this admin is done, and it's done individually per university. So. Communication with us is absolutely key here. There's a whistle-stop tour. As I say, rest assured, we will start having these conversations with you individually, depending on your own application process, program, destination, that kind of thing. 
So Canada. Canada is a little is is more holistic in its nature in the application uh, process or the admission process than the UK. That means that you have um, less need to be able to, or less less requirement for you to say this is the subject I'm applying to, the course that I'm applying to, because you can actually apply to a faculty. There's the ability to have movement within that faculty uh, once you join. So as long as you know roughly the subject area that you are looking to study when you're at the undergraduate level, um, then, um, then you can have a little bit more movement within that faculty. So that's Canada, more holistic than the UK but it is less holistic in its nature than the US. That means that um, in the US, you can explore a whole wide range of courses, irrespective of uh, the faculty that you're in. So um, Canada, more exploratory than the UK, a lot more, uh, but less so th than the US. And this is reflected in the admission process itself as well. So uh, the application criteria might vary from university to university, but the majority don't require a personal statement or letters of recommendation. Typically, um, a student will need to upload all their information and documents to an online portal. Okay, So there's a, a main centralised application system for Ontario. It's called the OUAC. The OUAC is where uh, students will select the courses or faculties uh, and universities in which they want to apply to, um, uh, add in a, a series of straightforward um, answers to questions and upload a few um, items. Um, and then that will then link to the university and then the universities within Ontario will be aware to make a a portal for you, a digital portal, and that's where they can ask for further documentation from you. So it's a lot more straightforward than uh, the systems in the UK and the US in terms of how much energy you need to spend in the, the application system itself. However, although I did highlight the fact that there is no personal statement, some universities will require a letter of motivation, which is very similar to a personal statement. So that's the OUAC for Ontario, but there's more to Canada than just Ontario. Uh, a very common destination for students is British Columbia uh, outside of Ontario, as well as Atlantic Canada, like Nova Scotia and so on, especially the Dal, Dalhousie. So uh, if you're applying to um, British Columbia, you would use that website here, apply.educationplannerbc.ca. When you're applying to Canada in general, please do pay attention to some of the specific course requirements. For example, the type of maths level that they're requesting you to have, okay? So are they requesting a particular faculty or course that you apply to to be analysis or applications, AA or AI? Because of this, do please uh, closely liaise with your college counsellor uh, and do, a there's this thing in Canada where they ask you to upload some current grades before semester one of grade 12 has been completed. So do please make sure that you are communicating with your college counsellor so that they know when and how to support you in uploading those current grade um, documents uh, in addition to your original transcripts. So, and, and also we're very good at talking about the various options that you have in Canada as well. So do please uh, spend time discussing this with your uh, counsellors, please. Now, moving on to the Netherlands. The Netherlands is also a very um, popular destination with our students. You do have these uh, universities uh, a range of different styles of universities there, three main ones. You've got your research universities, which are heavy on research. Um, and, for example, the University of Amsterdam. Then you also have universities of applied science, which in Dutch is called hogschools. So these are more focused on skill-based learning uh, with a view to applying your skills in, in a vocational format. Yet also there's an academic 
element as well. So it's not only vocational training in terms of trades. It is also more academic than that. And these are great courses if you like to learn by doing in the fields in which you're uh, looking at. And there are also these liberal arts style um, universities called university colleges. Now, uh, one great way to find out where all of the English taught courses are in the Netherlands is this website here studyinholland.nl. This is a great start uh, for you to, to start the process in your research uh, in the Netherlands. You usually will require an IB diploma or AP and a GPA when applying, so do check the program requirements carefully. There will also be a letter of motivation and references are common for uh, applications to the Netherlands. Sometimes specific course requirements are needed as, as well. Uh, that is dependent on the major that you are looking to Aware study. Of, is in, there is uh, this phrase called numerus fixus. It's Latin for fixed number. So what does this mean? It means that for some and not all universities, there will be a fixed number of places for particular courses. So once those places have been filled up, then the admissions process is shut down and those students uh, that have been offered places will um, move to, to, to go to, to study there in the following year. There are a fixed number of numerous fixers courses that you can um, apply to as well. The majority of courses uh, will give you a maximum of two numerous fixers courses uh, at the most. However, there are a few subjects where you can only apply to one numerous fixers course, such as physiotherapy. Some psychology courses are starting to creep in with only that requirement of one numerous fixers course uh, and medicine and a few others. So do please make sure that you've done your research when you are looking at these courses in studyinholland.nl. Be sure to work out if A, it's a numerous fixers course, and B, how many numerous fixers courses are you able to have as a maximum, one or two, okay? So spend time discussing this with your college counselor. They will help you, uh, guide you through, through this process as well. So there are interview and online tests, and when you go to actually apply, you need to use uh, register yourself to studylink.nl. So studyinholland.nl is great for learning about the courses. And then when you want to register to apply, you go to studylink.nl. Okay, that will then take you to uh, links to the specific course uh, application pages on each of the specific universities web pages but you must go through the study link bit first so then the system will know how many numerous fixes places or regular uh, courses you have applied to because they limit you so there are some issues associated with uh, with university the university experience in the Netherlands for some students in the past and mainly that falls down to accommodation so in the Netherlands, there's a bit of a shortage in housing. So as a result, uh, unlike you will have in the UK and uh, the US and, and Canada, you'll generally have support in those countries to find accommodation for that first year. In the Netherlands, you don't quite have that, um, that, that support um, as you arrive. So that you, you are kind of left a little bit uh, to your, your own devices to try and get that organized. So that's important to, to be aware of. So that as a result, there are some slight kind of cultural differences there when you're looking at the university life uh, in the Netherlands with the idea that a lot more is expected for you to go out there to, to, to organize uh, things for yourself. So now we move on to Spain, which is also um, a growing destination with our student population. Uh, you'll find that a lot of the applications are online. There are a lot of admission tests associated with some of these uh, universities. Decisions are based upon committee decisions. Uh, and then there are sometimes interviews as well. And some of these can be online, some of them can be in person, but the majority can be accessed online. So there are quite a few uh, universities that have courses in English. 
Some examples include Asade, IQS, EU Business School, CIS University, Carlos III, and IE. And with some of these, and, and, and ESCP as well. Uh, with a lot of these, there are uh, local London university representatives as well that you'll find, especially for ESCP, IE, Asade, and EU Business School. Then there are some other universities that are very highly ranked, and some have different uh, proportions of number of courses that are delivered in English and in Spanish. So, for example, the University of Navarro, which is very strong in business and STEM, what they do is they have some courses that are 20% delivered in Spanish with 80% in English. And you have a range of different weighting and options within the courses that you have there. So you could have some courses that are 100% Spanish or 80% uh, Spanish with 20% in English. So you know, do be aware of that when you're looking there. But Navarra is definitely one of those universities that's growing in pop uh, popularity with our students as well. And then beyond those uh, universities, which uh, are generally the private universities and business schools and those that focus on uh, an international market, you also have some top programs in Spanish as well. So universities that deliver also in Spanish. So for example, you have Complutense, uh, Carlos III also have Spanish courses, and you can see a range of other public universities there below. All right, so we'd just like to address uh, a small elephant in the room uh, in this post-pandemic landscape, and that's about uh, testing. Now, there are certainly academic tests that will, are necessary still. The entire um, world is not test optional, um, but we'd just like to highlight some of those and highlight also um, the landscape around the SAT and the ACT, which pr you know previously, pre-pandemic, were required for most colleges and universities in the US. So let's just start with kind of English proficiency uh, and that kind of thing. Now, if you are, if English is your second language and you have not been educated in ACS for more than three years, so if you have arrived in grade 10, English isn't your second language and perhaps you were educated for a few years not in English, then it is highly likely you will need to take some form of English proficiency exam. Most universities are able to be to waive English proficiency requirements for students who have been educated in English for all of their high school, so the last four years of high school, um, and also obviously waive English proficiency if you come from a, an English primarily speaking country. So it's complicated. The majority of our students don't have to sit English proficiency, but if you're a border, say, and you come from a, I don't know, for example, an Indian uh, education system uh, or a Japanese education system uh, where, you know, you haven't been educated in English for all four years, then you may or will be expected to take an uh, English proficiency test. And we can talk to you about the best ones to do that, depending on where you are applying to study. If you're applying to some selective courses, certainly places like Oxbridge, Mr. Forrester mentioned some of the Spanish university entrance exams, they are still required. You still have to sit those entrance tests um, and they are often need to be prepared for and discussed. So this is something that you need to be researching this semester so that you can do a little bit of digging and prep over the summer break. All right. Um, we have shared with you already an SAT prep course which is ongoing. Um, you, many of you will have done the optional PSAT uh, assessment to give you an idea of what the SAT looks like and how to uh, potentially you know, approach some of the questions and you'll have some scoring for that. Um, but just to touch on the college admissions tests uh, for mostly US universities, although some UK universities do accept and do use and still are willing to consider SAT and ACT. Um, it is very much a test optional landscape still in the US. We are seeing some universities moving back to requiring uh, one uh, of these admissions tests. It's important to note that no universities require both. Okay, so universities are not going to ask you for an SAT and ACT test. They are not going to have a preference between which one that you sit. But um, there are a number that are back to requiring and expecting it. Off the top of my head, those are currently Purdue for next year, Georgetown, MIT, the University of Florida, sorry, the Florida University State System, and in a number of other uh, state systems, I think potentially Iowa, 
and Georgia and Tennessee, that's right. Um, so those state university systems will require either an SAT or an ACT. Um, most private institutions and the California state systems are still test optional. And judging by the data that's come out from last year's uh, or this year's application cycle, we're seeing that you know the most the similar percentages of students are getting accepted with and without test scores. For example, if 40% of applicants chose not to submit test scores, then we're seeing roughly 40% of admitted students um, do not have test scores or did not sit test scores. So those ratios are, are quite similar. So we genuinely believe that it is still a test optional landscape for most institutions. Now, if you are a high school diploma and AP student and you're looking at applying to the UK, an SAT or ACT can be used to meet certain entry requirements. If you're a full IB student, this is irrelevant. They're not that interested in the SAT. Um, but if you are a US high school diploma and AP student, then you can use, again, not required if you're doing three or more APs, but you can use SAT to meet a certain entry requirement at many universities. So again, really important to start thinking and doing the research into UK-based entry requirements and testing. Um, just a very brief uh, note that there are lots and lots of resources on Schoology. Mr. Forrester already talked about the destination-specific resources. So there are a quick reminder that the grade 9, 10, and 11 uh, to-do lists and kind of specific information that might be useful to you on Schoology. Dig into the resources section of the College Counselling and Careers group. So that's at the top of the page, Groups, College Counselling Careers. You will find tons and tons and tons of resources uh, and to-do lists and things to get on with uh, if you are ever unsure of exactly what you can be doing. One of those things is the Grade 11 to-do list. And, and if you're not entirely sure what you can be doing right now, hopefully you do have an idea. Um, it is all up there on our Schoology page. And there's some screenshots here to show that. Um, thinking about your priorities, obviously, starting to research universities, there are lots of links and resources to do that. Um, so please do take a look at those to-do lists. As part of that to-do list, um, here are some kind of reminders of some events that are happening over the next couple of weeks and months. Now, we should be starting those one-to-one -one conversations, right? We should be starting those with you. Many of you have got them booked in with us already. Great. We want to try and meet all of you uh, at least once, maybe twice before the spring break. So please do start scheduling those one-to-one -one conversations. Um, we will be having, as we've mentioned already, advisory workshops on things like recommendation letters and sort of starting on, getting started on CVs. So they will happen in an advisory through March. We will be coming into your English class either side of the spring break to talk about essay writing, to start drafting um, US style personal essays and UK more academic personal statements. So we'll be coming to all of you. If you turn up to your English classes, you will get workshops on this with the idea being that you'll have a draft written by the summer break and we can give you feedback to go away and start honing these uh, essays and these written components through the summer break. And we also have some big events coming up. So on the 20th of April, we'll be running a UCAS uh, exhibition, so a trip to uh, the UCAS exhibition in Farnborough. Um, more information on how to register for that will be going out this in this week's uh, Friday newsletter, so do watch out to that. Um, we have a big international university fair happening here at ACS on April 25th, so that will be after school in the Sports Centre. We currently have 75 universities from all around the world registered to attend, so that's going to be really interesting and hopefully a valuable experience. Many of you might have come to the TASIS event last year. This year we're hosting it. Um, we're expecting to be drafting and giving you feedback on your essays and writing through April and May, certainly through the May and June, making sure that you've got in a good spot to go away and work on that writing, the written components of applications over the summer break. We will be having some advisory workshops on getting prepared for grade 12 and also setting up things like your UCAS and Common App uh, applications. So we'll be hosting workshops um, for you to, to, to get, come along to and, and get stuck into that. And then open day season really starts, really kicks off. So this is university open days, the chance to go onto campus to see accommodation, to chat to students, meet academics, uh, really kicks off in May, June, July, August, all the way through the summer. So um, when we start seeing universities um, kind of advertising these, we will post um, places where you can find open days. It's not just UK, that's US universities, that's European universities. There are all options to visit institutions to really get a better feel for what these places are like. Um, and then just to 
wrap up our kind of notes. We have lots of interesting universities coming in over the next couple of weeks. There's a list here starting, um, well, today actually, Tuesday the 24th, we had Canterbury Christchurch in, um, but we've also got a range of UK universities. It's UK university season at the minute. Um, we've previously had a lot of um, Canadian institutions and US institutions last semester, so hopefully it's an opportunity to engage with some UK universities. Um, just a small uh, change to this uh, slide here. The University of Bath are not coming in on the 21st because that is the PTC. We've delayed a week, so they will be coming in on the 1st of March, and that's um, that's been updated on Schoology, on Bridgeview, and on our visits document that is on Schoology also. So keep an idea on the uh, an eye on the Schoology calendar. Keep an eye eye on our Instagram account and obviously we put up posters around the school, the high school and the library when universities are coming in and put them in the weekly newsletters too. Okay, well thanks very much for your time, thanks very much for watching and listening. Uh, we understand it's lengthy and it's not all relevant to all of you, so thank you very much for, for sticking with us. Just a quick reminder before we finish that we're here for you, set up meetings with us, we're happy to have conversations with you. Um, please don't wait until the end of the school year, please don't wait until April and May time, um, because we want to get started with you as soon as we can. So whilst we might not be available all of the time, we do get booked up a few days in advance. If you think a week ahead, you should be able to find uh, plenty of availability for us just keep those lines of communication open once you've had that initial meeting with us you feel free to email us and ask any questions and we'll get back to you drop in for a quick 10 minute chat you can book those as well if you don't need a full 40 minute meeting and um, let's work together be organized take ownership of this process it is your process as we've said all along and um, hopefully we can work um, well effectively efficiently and, and get to where you want to go Thanks very much. There is one final thing about uh, email addresses and contacts, Mr. Forrester. Oh, okay. So um, just before we go to the emails, I just want to say um, now is the time to have those initial uh, grade 11 college counselling meetings. So please set up those times. Do it now. Don't leave it until uh, the end of the year where we start to learn about you then. Um, now is the time to, to, to do that. So in terms of the emails, you can see our emails there. Um, Jeremy Forrester, J Forrester at ACS, Sam Wickham, S Wickham at ACS. Um, now, M Mr. Sabanda has cu is currently um, using a temporary uh, email. Um, so if you are a boarder and he's working with the boarders and if you uh, want to start those initial meetings with him, he is available for those. So please do get in touch with him. He will be virtually working with you for the next few weeks until he arrives. And uh, the email address is there, unicounselor at acs-schools.com. So that's it from us. Um, that's the end of our presentation. Whatever day, uh, or time you are watching. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, hope to be seeing you very soon in those initial meetings and then beyond. Thanks now. <laughs>